Hello, my name is Dr. Shanti Shankar. I'm one of the senior lecturers with Department of Psychology at Bournemouth University. So as a research researcher, my research spans around areas of neuropsychology, specifically looking at how cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology inform clinical applications and allow you to focus on rehabilitation. So that's my key. And as a lecturer, I lecture on different topics around neuropsychology, biology, and a bit of stats. So today I'm going to be talking to you in this course on stress, which is covered over the six lectures that we will be looking at. The first lecture would be an introduction to stress and also looking at physiology of stress. So when you look at, when you hear the term stress, you probably come across this a lot in your life. How often do we actually say, I am really stressed today. We do that quite often, right? Especially if you're planning for an exam or if you're preparing for something that's a performance that you're giving and it's something quite important to you, then you're trying to get a bit anxious, but at the same time, you're a bit stressed about how you're going to do. And there is that bit of performance anxiety or stress that is acceptable and is needed in order to perform or do well. However, if the stress carries on for a longer period and creates more of an anxiety within your body, it's not just the term stress, but there is a physiology, a biological and a chemical change within your body. And that's what we are going to be exploring over the next few lectures that you'll be listening on stress. So when you talk about stress, there is an element of change within our system and there is enough evidence to support that. So the general adaptation syndrome, which is also referred to as GAS, was proposed in 1936 by Hans Sale. And he basically viewed stress as an attempt for somebody to adapt to the stress. So we all push through it on a normal day. But when this becomes a lot more severe, we refer to as acute stress, which occurs during some onset or offset period. However, if you are stressed across for a long period of time, we refer that to what is known as chronic stress. So there are different mechanisms that play a role when you experience acute or chronic stress. So when you talk about stress, let's take the example to work our way through it with you preparing for a workout or maybe you're running a marathon, for example, or half a marathon or 10K. So when you start preparing for it, the first day that you do a 10 kilometer, there is a bit of stress or a shock that we experience. So within the gas system proposed by Hans Hill, he proposed what is known as the three stages of stress. So the three stages are alarm reaction, resistance, and exhaustion. So what is alarm reaction? Just as the word says, there is an alarm that sets off within your body. So you have a hard day today your body starts showing that there's something not right and you notice it. The well-researched evidence talk about these as fight or flight response. So it could be a bit of heart racing, a bit of feeling exhausted, a bit of sweatiness or nervousness that you might experience. Again, the alarm that the body experiences differs from people to people. So for example, if I'm stressed or anxious, I tend to talk a bit fast compared to somebody else who might have a sweaty palm or somebody else whose heart might palpitate or someone else who might have a slight stammer while talking. So again, these are signs showing you that you're stressed or you're in shock. Once you've noticed that, the body automatically finds a way to resist that stress to be able to carry on its work. So with the same example of running a 10 kilometer run or a half marathon or a full marathon, you are stressed on day one and you push yourself through in order to ensure that you succeed and complete that. So your body is resisting that stress. It's putting a force to prevent that stress from actually spanning out and helping you complete a particular task. And in our normal words, we say we gather our nerves and complete what we're doing. And often when you do that, you would notice at the end, you are exhausted. That brings us to the third stage, which is exhaustion. So the amount of resistance your body has, the more tired or fatigue it's going to have. So summing it up within the gas system, 
you have three specific aspects or three stages, the alarm system, the resistance, and then we have the exhaustion. And this particular model has had empirical evidence. So right in 1936, when Sale proposed this particular model, he also brought it with research to support what he's claiming. He initially started using rats as one of his experiences and then subjected them to various stressors, which included change in temperature. And he found that there is a response that we often notice regardless of what kind of stress that mouse would have gone through. So irrespective of whether you're stressed because of a life stressor in your everyday life, you're stressed because of a change in environment, or you're stressed because of a work-related issue. And again, we will be talking about the sources of stress in lecture four. So depending on no matter what kind of stress you have or what are the causes of the stress, your body still has a very similar response that it reacts with and brings in the alarm, then you have the resistance and then you have the exhaustion that works in. So basically, the key point to this particular model is that the stress response is non-specific. So regardless of what stress you're going through, you do see the same response that you might experience. In 1971, Mason tried the same study in monkeys and they again linked to the same findings that there is a validity that they challenged the concept. The Mason study basically suggested that certain elements of exercise, cold, produced no change to the monkeys. Sale argued that the kind of stressors did not matter, your response was same. Whereas Mason challenged it by saying that there are different stressors that have a different causal effect on the response. So you have two researchers here who basically have a different idea of how stress can affect your personal response. So this is still a question that's been asked and debated. But from an individual perspective, you know what is your stressor. So taking what we've studied in a system or in a book or in a method, taking that into your life to support well-being and mental health, you need to be aware of the stressors. You know what kind of aspects stress you or what are the kind of changes that your body notices when you're stressed. How many of us actually binge eat during exams or stop eating because we are so anxious that we can't eat? So again, eating behaviors can be affected when we notice stress in our system. So identifying that, noticing how the body responds and working around that is quite key to managing stress. So in this particular lecture, we looked at some of the introduction to stress and looked at gas as the model of stress proposed, the three stages, which is, exist which is alarm system, resistance and exhaustion. And we looked at some of the research by Seal in 1936, where he suggested that it's important, no matter what kind of stresses you have, your responses are same. In 1971, Mason replicated the study and suggested that different kinds of stressors have different effect on monkeys. So these are two presenting arguments about this particular model from an empirical perspective. From your life perspective, it's important to identify what kind of experience stresses you and what kind of body reactions do you notice and that will help you come back to the uh, lecture six where we talk about managing and coping with stress and having that awareness is something that's quite key to understanding stress. So with that we summarize for this particular lecture and I will see you in lecture two where I talk more about stress and biology in detail. So thank you.